वेद मनामंत्र ओम सहना भवतु सहनो भुनक्तु सह वीर्यम करवा वह तेजस्वी नवधी तमस्तु मिद्विषा वह ओम शांति 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 हरि ओम टुडे वी विल कवर विष्णु सूक्त इट कम्स इन ऋग्वेद फर्स्ट बुक इट इज प्रथम मंडल एंड हिम नंबर इज फेड नंबर इज हंड्रेड फिफ्टी फोर You'll find all this in this book, Ved Vihangam. And uh, whenever we think of uh, Lord Vishnu, I mean, as far as deep prayers, deep prayers are concerned, and deep contemplation is concerned, we always think of the famous mantra, Tad Vishnu Parmam Padam, Sada Pashanti Suryo Divi Vachakshuratham. when we covered this mantra earlier i had requested you to recite it daily when you see the sun for the first time i personally do it every day and i feel so happy it's like says the sages can see that vishnu pada pada here means the bodh that is the state of vishnu lord vishnu doesn't stay somewhere as such is a state of being only the sages can see how absolutely clearly the way you see sun in the clear sky now when you look at the present religious scenario of india you will see that the worship is mainly directed towards shakti in various forms maybe kali maybe durga <coughs> or some other form <coughs> and shiva shiva starting from the himalayas to rameshwaram you find lord shiva everywhere even in the even in the state of kashmir where so much a problem was going on lord amarnath resides and even in china man sarovar <laughs> this these are the famous places of the abode of lord shiva he is everywhere in india and then we have shri ram and shri krishna and those who know hindu religion know that whenever we think of ram and krishna first thing that comes to our mind is they are the incarnations of bhagwan vishnu so you have three divinities three divine beings vishnu shiva and shakti these are the three most popular things if you go by the puranic traditions is famously known as brahma vishnu and shiva for some strange reason the worship of brahma diminished now we find it confined in some localities like puskar puskar in rajasthan but it is said that in earlier times worship of brahma was pretty popular in the present day afghanistan but i don't know if uh, the worship of brahma was as popular as it is of say shiva or vishnu now when you once you realize that the worst worship of shri ram and shri krishna who are considered to be incarnations of bhagwan vishnu is universal and shri ram and shri krishna they are now practically all over the world wherever the indians are going hindus are going they are taking shri ram and shri krishna with them so we need to know something about the worship of bhagwan vishnu in the vedas and in the book ved vihangam we chose 1154 that means from the first book him number 154 so <coughs> we are covering each of these hymns that comes in the ved vihangam systematically and those of you who have the book you can have a look at it and you will have something to to form your ideas because sometimes books help you in understanding things and sometimes talks help you in understanding and if you have both book and talk nothing better than that it's a very good combination 
we have repeatedly mentioned that as far as the vedas are concerned the four vedas are concerned the gods are like masks of the infinity or masks on the infinity we have discussed it many times any number of times and we will continue discussing it so now when you look at these masks why masks because infinite as such anant cannot be worshiped to say that somebody who worships god the infinite is the silliest thing that we can think of because infinity implies that you are that infinity now if you are that infinity who will worship whom the moment you say worship in whatever form in the form of prayer in the form of yagya in the form of repeating names in the form of repeating mantra in whatever form you say the moment worship the idea of worship comes duality comes the moment there is duality you cannot have infinity but at the same time you cannot let that duality be the ultimate this is this is a very tricky thing unless you understand this point it will be pretty difficult for anyone for anyone to understand the fundamentals of spirituality in spirituality god is infinite no religion will ever tell you that god is not infinite except for maybe some uh, worship system of the aborigines however if you simply say that god is infinite and you are one with that whole thing gets lost because you have to be spiritually evolved you have to be spiritually well educated to go for that idea till then you have to engage yourself in worship in various forms in whatever as we mentioned there has to be a verbal connect there can be connect through sacrifices that is yagya and uh, through ritualistic worship through whatever means through whatever means depending on what your mental inclination is uh, you can decide how to pray to god and actually you need masks because the mask that suits you the best we all have different tendencies and because we have different tendencies we like to worship that divinity that suits us most so there are literally hundreds of masks of these masks you will find very interesting thing that most of these masks were relegated to the pages of history that means they were forgotten now if you go through the vedas you will come across many names and you may not be familiar with those names even i am not familiar simply because uh i at times i go through the vedas and i am not a scholar of the vedas and i have not memorized the whole of vedas so i don't know all the names and i find it very in- interesting that these names are there and the second one is that some of the lesser gods they were accommodated variously and uh, there is a third category of say indra indra is a very interesting case indra lost his relevance although indra is the most important dog, god in the vedas and he continues to be worshiped even today but but his position has gone down radically it has gone down so these are the three three categories the fourth which is a very special one is that of agni and vishnu agni has become all pervasive the previous talk uh, that we finished maybe a week ago in that we had discussed agni suktam the first hymn of rigveda and we had mentioned that how hindus have continued to pay homage pay respect to agni however agni continues to find a very important role not as important as 
say as in vedic times but in today's times also agni is pretty pervasive and that's why you find that uh, whenever there is a very important puja very important sacred fire is lit during marriage ceremonies sacred fire is lit during upanayan that is sacred thread ceremony sacred fire is lit and when somebody is cremated sacred fire is lit fire continues to be there but vishnu lord vishnu he is the only god from the vedic times who became very 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 important you might contest it and you say that shiva also became important but however shiva was in a different form not the way it is our uh, uh, lord vishnu he became all engulfing god lord vishnu and vaishnav traditions became extremely important now when we talk of shiva shiva was worshiped slightly differently so what what uh, we do in the form of worship to lord shiva is slightly metamorphosed verse version not not what it was during the vedic times but as far as vishnu is concerned the tradition continues so it's very interesting thing now vishnu as far as uh, the term is concerned it comes from the root of vish which means to pervade so vishnu means all pervasive vishnu is all pervasive whatever you can think of wherever you can think of lord vishnu is there and uh, this hymn the hymn that we are discussing it details that idea is a beautiful hymn so vishnu is extremely famous for his wide strides like in a fav- in that famous puranic story of uh, bali the king bali of uh, daitya vamsha in one step lord vishnu measured the whole of earth in the second the whole of space then said tell me where do i keep my third step and bali said on my head so so lord vishnu has very interesting characters although some of these interesting characters in today's times that we find in lord vishnu belong to maybe say indra but uh, we hindus for us religion is a dynamic thing it's an ex- extremely dynamic idea and we are the only religion that is dynamic by nature by dynamic we mean that one thing remains constant not that everything changes one thing remains constant and that is god is infinite and everything else is dynamic then that's why we are not much concerned about how we worship how we pray we are not much concerned about which mask of the infinite we are worshiping for example i myself in today's times i belong to ramkrishna mission and for me shri ramkrishna is god or other god in the present times came in the form of shri ramkrishna so shri ramkrishna is the form of lord vishnu only so mask is not important what it represents is important so the first mantra first mantra says beautifully vishnu nu kam viryani pravocham yah parthivani bimame rajangsi yo aska bhayat uttaram sadastam vichakramana treda urugaya some of these expressions like uruga is a very common expression for bhagwan vishnu we will explain each of these terms in earlier talks we had mentioned and today also we mentioned that worship worship is performed variously in the vedic times the most popular form of worship was through performance of yagya sacred fire was lit and oblations were poured these hymns that we are going through sukta they are known as sukta these sukta they have two fold purposes one is you can perform yagya with the help of these suktas and secondly you can use them simply as prayers 
Third, if you come across a beautiful line, the line that you love, you can convert it into a mantra. And for that, you will have to add pranav and bija, etc. That's a different thing that's not meant for us. It says, this, this, when it begins, the first mantra, you have to imagine this situation where a yajna is being performed. Now, in this particular case, this yajna is not being performed for oneself. Of course, one can perform yajna for oneself. This particular yajna, it is meant for a client, yajman. It's a very common term, yajman. For whom you are worshipping for a fee. So, the practice was that somebody who himself was not able to perform a yajna, they would appoint some learned Brahmin, well-versed in the Vedas, pure, etc. And they would perform yajna. And the purpose was manifold. For example, we know that King Dashtatha, he had this putreshti yajna performed so that he could get sons. Now, in this case, the purpose is to go to the highest heaven. Now, whenever these yajnas were performed, usually both husband and wife used to sit together. You might have heard of some strange comments against Hindu religion which says that it discriminates against females. No, it doesn't. In most yajnas, wherever there was a need for a yajmana, both husband and wife had to sit. It was compulsory. And those of you who might have visited temples, you'd find that even today, husband and wife sit together when puja is performed in any of the temples. There is so much of bad mouthing against Hindu religions. Very sad. <laughs> those of you who have started understanding the real nature of Hindu religion should stand up and try to clear all these misconceptions and the, all these propaganda going against Hindu religion. It says, I'll now recite the acts of Vishnu. Earlier we had mentioned that there are three ways to perform prayer, to offer prayers. One is to think of the form, form of God. Second is qualities. And the third is acts, Leela. Here, actually it's the qualities. And with the qualities, a little bit of form is described and a little bit of acts. It begins with, I recite the acts. So, as we proceed, we will see that all the three are combined in one. Who made the three walls with element? Parthivani. Parthivani word has come from Prithvi. Prithvi means earth, but it means all the three worlds. Bhurbhuva Swaha, that is the physical world that we see, the subtle world where gods reside, and third, which is the abode of Vishnu, who made the three worlds with elements and fixed their support for dwelling. These spheres are not empty spheres. These are teeming with beings, different kinds of beings. Here on this physical universe, we know how human beings are there and animals are there and birds are there. And we know how different kinds of insects are there, lower animals are there. Earlier we didn't know, but today we know that bacteria and viruses are there. But if we are to believe the religious sacred books, we know that subtle beings are also present here all the time. So when Lord Vishnu created the three worlds, fix them, it was not just empty. So wherever there is space, wherever there is space, steaming with different kinds of beings, That is, fix their support for dwelling. <laughs> and traversing thrice with wide strides, 
That means Lord Vishnu is not somebody who created and who forgot. Like we have, we had this idea from Newton's time, the great watchmaker, where said that God created the universe and he let it run like that, just like that. God is not like that. Went over the entire place thrice in three strides. That means he is always present there. And hence is praised by the greats. He is praised by the greats. Why? Because without any effort he created the three worlds. He didn't have to labor. He didn't have to labor to create these wor- these worlds. Uh, the way you say, we would require labor to create a house. And these were three. The physical, the subtle, and the causal. So these sages, those who are present here, They are narrating his greatness. Here, Viryani means the great deeds. What are the great deeds? One of them is how he created these universe. And uh, how did he create? Parthivani Bhimame Rajangsi. Raja. Raja means particles. Those of you who have been listening to our talks would remember that. This term Raja. It keeps coming every now and then. Whenever there is mention of space, the term Raja is there. Later on, Raja was changed with Akash. Akash is the most common word today. And we say that Akash is present everywhere. Akash means space. Akash also means the finest particles of creation. And is Askabhayat. He created space as pillars of support of the three worlds. So these three worlds, the physical, the subtle and the causal, they are there because there is space to support them. Otherwise the whole thing will disintegrate. Of course we find in Gita that the Lord says that Gama Vishya Chha uh, Gama Vishya Chha Pusnamid this whole earth I uphold with my power here in this case it says that space space has such character that space itself has such character that these walls are in the right place and not the empty walls but full of beings now there is this wonderful word Urugaya Urugai can mean wide strides. Lord Vishnu, who can take wide strides, can cover the entire universe in three steps. And it also means praised, praised by the sages. Sages praise Lord Vishnu. Urugai. So Lord Vishnu is praised by the sages. So there's one big problem in the Vedas that Words have different meanings. A particular word may mean something. It may also mean something different. However, whatever the meaning in case of Urugaya, whether of wide strides or of someone who has been praised by the sages, the greatness of Lord Vishnu continues. Pra tad Vishnu stavate virena mrigo na bhima kucharo girishtha. Yes, Urusu Trishu Vikramanesu Adikshiyanti Bhuvanani Vishwa. I had to put uh, Vishnu Suktam in this book, Ved Vihanga. One reason was that translations by the Western scholars ruined the spiritual content of this hymn. If you want to ruin a system, if you want to destroy a system, give it in the hands of the incompetent. Particularly those, now, incompetent are again of two kinds. One is those who know that they are incompetent and so they are 
they'll just somehow they will somehow preserve it for example the brahmins most brahmins knew that they cannot understand the meaning of the veda so they preserve it how by memorizing and passing it on to their disciples and then there are the incompetents who think that they are more competent than the original masters and that's how science was destroyed in the hands of the church those of you who know some history of science and history of church you know that the church started dictating what science would be like and there was a famous dark ages similarly if you hand over anything to scholars they are going to ruin it if you hand over poetry to the scholars they will ruin it hand over literature to the scholars they will ruin it and hand over sacred texts to the scholars they will ruin it today science is trying to judge the content of the bible do they have the authority to do it do the scientists understand the meaning of mythologies no they don't the scholars have this big problem that they take up a word find the most popular meaning sometimes they go to the root of that word and come up with some meaning and that meaning may be absolutely strange as far as the context is concerned if you go strictly say by verse you may feel that okay it's perfectly all right but as far as context is concerned it doesn't make any sense the tragedy with vishnu sukta is that english scholars ruined this and unfortunately for us many of the translators from india in different languages they depended on these english translators and as how in indian languages also the vedas were translated absolutely wrongly which had no meaning we will just be mentioning here pratid pra tad vishnu stavate veerena mrigona bhima kucharo girishtha there are mriga bhim kuchara and girishtha four very interesting words when translated they appear like he is somebody who stays in a mountain in a cave and is like a lion you know lion hunter something like that. we have never heard of any such thing about lord vishnu and yet the meaning is entirely different it means this first word is mriga mriga is a lion like a lion and bhimah mighty lord vishnu is all mighty it says vishnu is glorified due to his might who is leonine and boundless he is infinite and girishta giri those of you who have some idea about indian language you know that giri means mountains and because giri is mountain they translated vishnu stays in mountain caves gir gir means words lord vishnu lord vishnu lives in words living in words mean the intent of the vedas one meaning of uh, word is vedas in indian tradition meaning is that whenever we pray whatever prayer you may make even a simple prayer like tumeva mata cha pita tumeva we have to know that the lord himself recites in that prayer and if that prayer is performed properly with intensity with the right understanding the meaning of those words will be revealed if somebody asks you where does god reside god resides in the words we normally say god resides in the heart no god resides in the words so he says who is leonine boundless praised by the sages and because in his three white strides 
abide the beings of the worlds. Lord Vishnu can cover the entire universe, that means visible and invi invisible universe in three sides. So all beings are actually bound in Lord Vishnu. And yet he himself is boundless. His strength is unparalleled. No one can match him. Kuchara. Kuchara actually means he is deadly to the enemies. And that's why we find that famous demons like Madhu, Kaitav and Hiranyakashipu and all, they were all vanquished by Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu is deadly to the enemies. Unfortunately, this is this particular mantra has been translated by the Western scholars in such a way as if he is like a tribal person, extremely ferocious, etc. No, it's not that. So, the meaning is very simple. Vishnu is glorified due to his might. His strength is such that he is being glorified. His leonine, because uh, lion is often compared, whenever we have to express strength, we use the word lion, leonine. Of course, uh, tiger is also extremely powerful and they say that whenever there is a fight between tiger and lion, a tiger wins. But in India, lion has a majesty about it. So, strength with majesty. Hence, leonine. It's boundless, infinite. And as we ex explained, just in his three strides, he can cover the entire universe. Pra Vishnave, the next mantra three. Pra Vishnave Shushum Etu Manma Girikshita Uru Gayaya Vrishne Ya idam dirgam pratam sadhastam eko vimame trivi ita padebhi. It's mantra number three. Actually, these are not very complicated things. These are simple prayers. That's why I'm explaining it in very simple words. Now, may this prayer born of strength. This line, <laughs> Pra Vishnave Shusam Etu Manma. Shusam is strength. Probably you may not have ever thought, ever, that prayers require strength to reach God. As kids, we prayed for rain so that the so that there's this cool holiday. And because of our immaturity, we wished ill of this person and that person. And yet, our prayers were rarely fulfilled. And even today, our prayers continue to remain unfulfilled. Why? Because the words that we use in prayers, they lack strength. They cannot reach up to God. How to, how to have that power? That power comes through tapasya, through yajna. If we pray that, oh God, give me wealth. Will you get wealth? No, you won't. God will give you wealth. Provided your words can reach him. And, and that's why at times people ridicule religion and say, God is deaf, God is blind, etc. I said, oh, God doesn't listen to all these things. See, your words don't even reach him. <laughs> so, here the idea is not that God, the prayers do not reach God because God is present everywhere. What they mean to say that when you pray for something, there has to be intensity. When there is intensity, it means you have intentions. And your intentions should not be collapsing with the intentions of others. There's a very popular story, one of those silly stories about somebody going to Mother Kali's temple and praying, Oh, Mother, this is a job interview. May I get the job? And Mother Kali says that, look, a while before you, another person came and he also prayed for that job. So this person was slightly furious, says, okay, do what you feel best. And Mother Kali replies, that exactly is what I do. 
Now, many of us go and pray to God so that we may get that one single job. Whose prayer will God listen to? One who is the most competent. That means we come back to that where competence matters. In this world, competence matters. Do you deserve it? Do you deserve to get this? No, you don't. And that's why you don't get. No amount of your praying can help you. Because prayers don't reach God. Prayers don't reach God because this word shum, that strength, that strength comes from your intensity, your activity. When you do tapasya, perform tapasya. And that's why we find that in Indian traditions, whenever somebody wanted something which was out of the norm, that person sat down for tapasya. When Parvati wanted Lord Shiva, as husband. She sat for tapasya. She sat for tapasya. And when Bhasmasur, who ruined himself, who burned himself down ultimately, he also sat for tapasya to have that unique power. And think of any of these asuras. Each one of them performed tapasya. You perform tapasya, your prayers will reach God. God is everywhere. The thing is, whether or not your words have the strength, your words need to have strength. This is a beautiful line. I mean, these things we all need to contemplate. As you contemplate upon these ideas, meaning becomes clear, clear, life becomes easier, and then you stop blaming others. You are not getting something simply because your words do not have the strength. If your words have the strength, this will come out true. How come? He is a Vrishne. Vrishni is another, uh, is Vrishni Kul, this one dynasty Vrishni. Uh, he is referred as Vrishne. <coughs> Here, this Vrishne means bountiful, one who showers gifts. So God can give gifts if you wants. You have to have the competence. Just that. And who holds the heights of the universe. What happens is that uh, although we are familiar only with the physical universe and naturally we know that there is no support for this physical universe, etc. But no, that cannot be. Whenever you have some kind of circular motion, because everything is moving. We have we have always believed that everything is moving. There is some kind of rotation going on. And if there is some kind of rotation going on, we are probably on the fringe. We are the fastest moving things. That is physical universe. And as you go deeper, they are slower moving. And because they are slower moving, they age slowly. That's why the gods, the gods, they age slowly. And when you go to Brahmalok, the ultimate, there is practically no aging and it lasts for billions of years. So there is that some kind of stability there. Stability comes from God. And that's why the expression of support repeatedly is the Lord Vishnu who does all this. Then there is Mantra number four. Yashya tri purna madhuna padani akshya mana sadhaya madanti ya u tri dhatu prithvim utadhyam eko dadhara bovanani vishwa. Lord Vishnu is being praised because one way of uh, praying to God is to praise. Now, this praise is not empty praise, it's about the characteristics of God. Now, when you are listing out the characteristics of God, it leaves an impression in your mind what God stands for, what divinity stands for. And somehow you are connected with that. You also have those qualities, just that you have brought ignorance upon yourself and you want to feel limited. Him whose three places are filled with sweetness. The greatness of Lord Vishnu lies in being full of sweetness. Yeah. 
the three three steps of lord vishnu by which he measures the entire universe it is nectar like and it is perfect imperishable giving joy to all beings you can say that it's not possible not everyone is full of joy actually everyone is full of joy but that is a different subject and uh, we will not get into it something like you know when we when we go to watch movies or when we read tragic novels we enjoy that too we being pure consciousness we being atman we are experiencing this world and because we are experiencing the world the world has to be experienced various ways pain is one of them when i was a kid this uh, karela vegetable bitter gourd or whatever it's known as i don't know uh, i was horrified by that thing how can somebody eat that vegetable the bitter thing i still don't take <laughs> so to me it's a ridiculous idea and yet you come across elderly people who love karela i'm using the hindi term and karela is the term used in bengal also but food is considered to be complete in india they say that uh, shat ras six kinds of tastes must must be there everything should be there in food now to complete a meal a complete meal has to have six kinds of tastes so just like that to enjoy the universe you need to have all kinds of emotions is god's universe there cannot be misery we want to taste misery that's why we are miserable this my next book arohan arohan that ascent with gita there we have discussed it in detail and he who alone upholds the earth sky universe if god does not these will disintegrate because ultimately these are particles and particles have a tendency to drift away the particles don't drift away you will say that the earth is in a motion because of this motion because of this motion it doesn't drift away etc that's a different thing that motion itself that fo the motion that makes earth revolve completely within 24 hours and go around the sun say in one year it's all god's power it's all god wills that way the presence of god god is holding the three universes physical subtle and causal and that are made of three elements three elements that's very interesting earth water and fire instead of five because normally we talk about five elements but sometimes in the vedas we come across three elements in chandogya upanishad also there is a mention of three elements nothing very important about it sometimes in short they talk only about three tadasya priyam abhipatho asyam naro yatra dev yavo madanti urukramasya sahi sahi bandurita vishnu pade parme madva utsaha may i attain that cherished abode this is something interesting that you people should be knowing very well very often we when we talk about vishnu lok brahma lok shiva lok etc we have this idea as if there is some kind of heaven there is some kind of place where lord vishnu resides particularly those of you who have studied the puranic literature you find the description of these heavens just like that is it is as if a beautiful city whose king is say lord vishnu so when they talk about vishnu like lok vaikuntha dham they describe it like that but no it's not that is the ever presence of vishnu or ever presence of shiva that means that state of being 
in which you are one with your chosen ideal, your chosen deity, your God. That is that look. So for a Shiva devotee, being in that state of mind where that person is continuously with Lord Shiva, is Shiva look. Now what is that Shiva look like? Normally, we cannot understand all this. That's why they talk about a bodh. That's an easier way. Every time they use the expression Vishnupada, Vaishnavapada, Paramapada, they mean to say your state of being is not some physical place. It's a state of being. And even if you consider it as a place, it will mean the ultimate center of everything where there is no motion. And because there is no motion, you really cannot call it place because any space, <coughs> as described even in the Vedas, has to be in motion. Particles are in motion. So may I attend that cherished abode, that Vishnu Dham, where devotees live and rejoice. Now this is again a very interesting thing because you are not only devotee. It's not like husband-wife relation where husband and wife are committed to each other. It's not that only you and your chosen ideal, that is God, is there. There are the devotees. So naturally you can see that when other devotees, other like-minded devotees are there, so naturally it now looks more like a place. And that's why they use this kind of expression. Because these expressions are meant for people who are not really spiritually enlightened. Because in the ultimate state of spiritual enlightenment, you, you will know that you alone exist. But till, till you reach that, others too exist. And if others exist, God whom you worship, others are also worshipping. And if you are one with God, they are also one with God. It is with this idea that it is being explained. Where devotees live and rejoice from their springs in the supreme abode of Vishnu. The well-wisher of all. Stream of joy. The joy that is there in the universe. It streams from Lord Vishnu. It streams from that abode. Now, very important thing here is that very often we use the expression unalloyed joy. That means when we are on this earth, when we are in this physical universe, we are experiencing bliss. We are experiencing joy in variously. Sometimes we have to shed tears. Sometimes we have to suffer, etc. Sometimes we have to face cruelty, etc. However, when you are in that final, that ultimate abode, there. <laughs> There is no such kind of division. It's unalloyed love. Those of you who have been, who are into meditation and deep meditation, you know that when you meditate deep, when you pray deep, how your mind becomes completely unified. We are not talking about samadhi. We are just talking about doing japam. We are talking about your mind being absorbed in God. You don't feel anything. You feel you are there and God is there. You are there. Your God is there. This unalloyed state of joy. Excuse me. <coughs> That's being described here. <coughs> it is that joy. That unalloyed joy. That becomes differentiated. That gets differentiated. And appears in. This physical universe in various forms as various emotions. <coughs> now, a common man, particularly those who are devoted to some god, they don't want mukti. They don't want to be one with their chosen deity. There's a very famous saying, I want to taste sugar. I don't want to become sugar. So for such people, for such devotees, this is very important because they will ultimately be going to that state of existence where they taste 
unalloyed bliss where like minded devotees will be there and then this next verse is ta wang vastuni ushmasi gamadhye yatra gavo bhuri shringa ayasa atrah tat uru gayasya vishnah paramam padam av ati bhuri you will note the use of this expression paramam padam repeatedly now whenever we talk of vishnu as we mentioned in the beginning param pad the uh, most common term it says may you find now uh, this is being addressed to the yajmana those householders who got these brahmins to perform this sacred yagya says they have a desire to go to the heaven so the sages pray may you find a rest in that cherished abode that cherished lok ta wang actually it means you too you too who are engaged in this yakya and vastuni means a restful place the place where you find rest a cherished because you have desired it's not that you is being forced upon you where the divine light spreads wide gamadhye yatra gavo bhuri shringa ayasa see the translators have uh, if you give a free go to our translators they wish to say that you are performing this yagya and once you die you'll go to that abode where there are cows with huge horns gavo bhuri shringa maybe multiple horns bhuri shringa they have translated as huge horns it makes no sense lord vishnu with cows it simply makes no sense and yet what is very sad is sainacharya who wrote the commentary for these things he made abundantly clear amply clear <laughs> bodhishringa means well lit so bodhishringa is actually bright extremely bright and gava surprisingly gava means gava term has come from gam dhatu to move it means light and we always knew that light moves light moves and if light moves it has to have some kind of speed we thought that uh, the popular belief is that light moves instantaneously it was some experiments in physics that fixed the speed of light based on which einstein came up with this theory of relativity somehow we knew this that light travels and that's why one name for light is gava the same the same word which is used for cows to cow moves so he says where the divine light spreads wide whenever we uh, describe this highest abode we talk about that abode being so bright that nothing else can light it up न त्र सूर्यो भाति न चंद्रतारक इन दैट अबोध अबोध ऑफ गॉड इज नाइदर सन नॉर मून इट शाइन्स ब्राइट बाई इट्स ओन एफलजिन्स एंड दैट्स वॉट इज बींग सेड इन दी वेदर्स बट दीज पीपल फॉर दिस लोक ऑफ लॉर्ड द बेनोवलेंट लॉर्ड इज ऑलवेज बेनोवलेंट shines with great splen- splendor lord is consciousness consciousness means effulgence and that effulgence you don't have to die and go to some heaven and experience <laughs> you can experience it here itself like in katok mission we have angust matra jyoti riva dhumukah if you meditate properly in your heart you will experience that light 
And that light will be of the size of a thumb. A light. Which has no smoke for its covering. That light. It doesn't burn your eyes. So soothing. There's a light of consciousness. There's a light that pervades everything. So, says, that's Lord. And if Lord is effulgent like that, like Gita 11 chapter, those of you who have studied, know, Devi Surya Sastras, it says, as if in the space, the sky, thousands of suns have risen simultaneously, that kind of brightness. What we read in Gita, it is there already in the Ved. That's the that is why the Vedas are considered to be extremely sacred, extremely important. You'll find that all these spiritual ideas, the great ideas, have come directly from the Vedas. However, do remember that these are not poetic descriptions, but these are the descriptions of spiritual reality. The spiritual reality is that if you reach that state, that state of Lord Vishnu, you will be one with that light. You will be amidst light. How to do it? Perform yajna properly. Or pray regularly. Or do meditation. Whether you chant the sacred name or you meditate upon it, you offer daily prayers properly and you perform yajna. The results will be the same. You will never ever have to return to the other three universes, the physical or the subtle or the causal. So that's the wonderful Vishnu Suktam. Here we end. Thank you so much. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Om Krishna. Shri Ram Krishna.